Hi and welcome to this tutorial on halide ions and their reactions. In the previous tutorial, we learned about disproportionation reactions. So when we react a uh, halogen with hot or cold alkalis, and we also learned about these reactions in the formation of bleach and the chlorination of water too. So in this session, we're going to look at the reducing power of halide ions and how we test for those ions too. So have a think. What do you think the reducing or what do you think the trend is in the reducing ability of the halide ions as you move down the group? So we've got the halogens here, but imagine these are their ions instead, etc. What happens to their reducing ability as we move down? You might want to use oil rig to help. So if we're thinking about oil rig, reduction is gain. So their reducing ability, their ability to reduce something else, for example, as we move down the group, it's going to increase. OK, so let's have a look at why it's going to increase. So like I said, as we move down the group, the reducing ability of the halide ions is going to increase because when we've got a halide ion acting as a reducing agent, it's going to give its electrons to something else. So reduction is gain. That other compound is going to gain that electron. It wants to give it away. So we've got a halide ion with its eight electrons in its outermost shell and it's going to give it away. And that means the halide ion itself is losing that electron. And so therefore, the bigger the halide ion is, the further out or further away from the positive nucleus that electron is that it's going to lose, the easier it's going to be to lose that electron. Hence, as we move down the group, the radius gets bigger, the shielding increases, and therefore it's going to be easier for iodine to lose or an iodine ion an iodide ion, to lose that outermost eighth electron than it is, for example, chlorine. And really, we can relate that to the fact there is less attraction between the outermost electron and the positive nucleus. I've got an example here to demonstrate. So let's make these into ions first. So let me add that extra electron there to make these all the octet. Oh, actually, most of these are. So... Obviously, then I'd put minuses around all of them because these are all the ion forms. And as you can see, iodine has got a much, much larger distance between the positive nucleus and the outermost electron that it's going to lose. For example, this one here, if I colour them in blue. Um, oh, there it is over there. That was the one that was missing. Um, so, yeah, we've got a much, much greater distance and therefore it's much easier for iodine to lose that most outer electron and act as a reducing agent than it is for fluorine or chlorine or something before it. It's that shielding effect and it's that attraction that we're talking about. And that shielding is going to weaken that attraction. So the reaction with the, uh, of the halide ions with sulfuric acid can be used to compare the reducing powers. We can actually qualitatively see the difference in the reducing power of the halide ions. So when we react the halide ions with concentrated sulfuric acid, a hydrogen halide is produced as an initial product. And other products, products can also be produced depending on which halide ion you're looking at or that you have in the mixture. And so we can use this as a qualitative test. So let's have a look at, for example, um, we can put a, a salt in, of course, so sodium fluoride or sodium chloride, and these will immediately associate, of course, into the sodium, which is going to do nothing, and our, our halide ion. There we go. So this is a good way of us producing our halide ions that we are looking at. So when we react a halide ion with um, sulfuric acid or a chloride ion with sulfuric acid, then we are going to get hydrogen fluoride or hydrogen chloride as a gap, as a product. So hydrogen fluoride or hydrogen chloride. OK, and we're going to get misty fumes from this gas being made. And um, that's how we can identify that gas has been made. And the reaction doesn't proceed after this because HF and HCl are weak reducing agents. They're not strong enough to reduce sulfuric acid. So if I actually show you with the equation, so sodium fluoride, we are reacting it with sulfuric acid. We're going to make NaH2SO4 and HF. So this is not able to reduce the sulfuric acid. And then we're going to get a very, very similar result with the chloride ion. So NaH2SO4, 
plus HCl, and those are both gaseous, hence the misty fumes. This isn't a redox reaction as the oxidation states of the halide and the sulphur, they don't change in this reaction. Let's have a look at a bromide ion instead, so Br minus. So we're going to have sodium bromide reacting with sulfuric acid and we're going to get NaH2SO4 and the hydrogen bromide being gaseous. So the reaction does proceed after this because HBr is strong enough a reducing agent. So it's able to react with H2SO4 in a redox reaction. So we're going to take this HBr and we're going to react it. So HBr, which is going to be aqueous now, H2SO4, and we're going to make gaseous bromine, SO2 and H2O, and then I'm just going to quickly balance these accordingly. Put a two in front of there as well. And we can see in terms of oxidation numbers, our S has gone from plus six over here to plus four. And my bromine has gone from minus one to zero. Okay, so we can say that my Br has been oxidized from minus one to zero, and my S has been reduced from plus six to plus four. What about our reaction with sodium iodide? So we're looking at the iodide ion here, and we are going to get our NaI plus H2SO4. We're going to get NaH2SO4 plus HI. So HI is then able to reduce sulfuric acid because it is a strong reducing agent. So we're going to get 2HI plus H2SO4. You'll start to notice patterns. It's very similar to the reaction we just looked at, just with I instead, plus 2 H2O. Okay, and so we've got this reaction, that's an optional one, and then we've got this reaction as well. So SO2, we've got further reduction happening. H2S plus 3I2 plus 2H2O. So check your specification for how much of this you need to learn. OK, and if we're doing our reducing states, we've got for iodine in both of these, we've got minus one to zero. OK, so that's the same for both. And in this one up here, we're going from plus six to plus four, similar to the reaction we looked at before. But then iodine, hydrogen iodine is such a strong reducing agent, it's able to do it again. The halide ion is a strong reducing agent. So plus four to minus two. OK, so we can see in the above reaction, we have reduce the sulfur from plus six to plus four. And here we've reduced the sulfur from plus four down to minus two. And if you were curious, this compound here, H2S, it's toxic. It's got quite a sort of smells of egg, ultimately. We can also use silver nitrate solution to identify and distinguish between the different halide ions. They're going to form a precipitate. OK, so it must be acidified using dilute nitric acid first, as this is going to remove any excess ions present in the solution that might react and therefore affect the results. So we're going to put a precipitate of the silver halide. We're going to put, my mistake, the acidified silver nitrate in the test tube and we're going to get a precipitate formed. So, for example, we're going to have silver there, aqueous is going to pick up a halogen that's in the solution and it's going to form a precipitate. Okay, you can see a compound AGX, AGCL, AGBR, AGF. And that is going to tell us, the colour of that precipitate is going to tell us what halide ion we therefore had in the mixture. And this is summarised here. So we won't get a precipitate with fluoride, fluoride, but if we've got chloride ions in the solution, we're going to make AGCL, which is a white precipitate. And 
with brom bromide ions, we're going to make AGBR, which is a cream precipitate. And with iodide ions, we're going to make AGI, silver iodide. And that is a yellow precipitate. Now, I'm sure you'll notice that white, cream and yellow can be very hard to distinguish between using just our eyes. So we do a second test. We can have a go at dissolving them in ammonia, dilute or concentrated. So first of all, you're going to get your result and then you're going to add some dilute ammonia. If it dissolves, then that means you've got chloride ions there. If it doesn't dissolve, you should then try concentrated ammonia. If that dissolves, then you've got bromide ions. If it doesn't dissolve in either dilute nor concentrated, it means you've got iodide ions. So as you can see here, silver chloride is the most soluble in ammonia, hence it dissolves in dilute. You're going to need concentrated for, bromi for bromide ions or silver bromide. And for silver iodide, it's completely insoluble. You're not going to be able to get it to dissolve at all.